Thank you very much, Dylan, for introducing us just now. So hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Collins. I am a PhD student working under Shiri Azencott, who just spoke so eloquently right now to all of you at, here at Cornell Tech and Cornell University. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Sensha, and today we'll be talking about um, our project. And so we're all here because we all know how incredibly immersive and visual VR is, but we're also all here because we all know how inaccessible it is for blind and low vision people. There has been prior work in this area before, but today we want to tell you about a new technique that we explored to address this problem, which is using a sighted guide in VR. VR has been increasing in popularity, especially for social interaction, which is called social VR, which is when you can connect with others and move around in a virtual environment and talk to each other in a virtual space. And there are very many popular social VR apps. Do we have a clicker up here to move between our slides? Yes. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> There are many very popular social VR apps such as VR Chat, Rec Room, and Horizon Worlds, but these apps and all other VR applications remain largely inaccessible for blind and low vision people. And researchers have been trying to solve this problem through various projects such as on navigation and object perception, but most of these are very simple and very um, single user experiences with highly specific goals. And these projects might not work well for complex, unfamiliar environments often found in social VR. This emphasizes the need for, for versatile accessibility tools for social VR, which are very complex and multi-user VR spaces. And since these are multi-user VR spaces, this allows the opportunity for social support and also assistance and allow a guide to be there with you in the virtual space. Therefore, we were inspired by the sighted guide technique in the physical world, which is often used by blind and low vision people to enhance the, ability, as the accessibility of an environment. This is done through first a physical connection between the, the blind and low vision person and the sighted guide, where the blind or low vision person grabs the elbow of the sighted guide, and second, the verbal information that is given from the sighted guide to the blind or low vision person. This then allows a navigation and scene understanding, and we wanted to explore how we can apply this to social VR. The research questions that motivated this work was first, what accessibility needs can a guide address for blind and low vision people in VR? And second, what design approaches for a guide can address those needs? So now I'm gonna take over here and tell you guys a little bit about how we actually went about trying to put this guidance framework into virtual reality. So um, it may not be a surprise to you, but seeing that we are a research lab, uh, could you progress to the next slide? Thank you. We decided to approach this by performing a study, a research study. Now. The actual design of this study that we decided to pursue was a bit more complicated than just deciding that we wanted to do a study. This space, virtual reality, is something that we could probably ask to about, about to a decent number of people on the street who've experienced virtual reality. But for our user group, blind and low vision users, that isn't quite the case. Our lab really values user-centered design and actually getting the opinions and perspectives of the blind and low vision community that we are trying to serve. However, that very community does not have a lot of access to virtual reality right now because it is so inaccessible. As a result, we decided that the best way to actually pursue this study design would be to bring in blind and low vision users to be our participants in the study and actually give them a concrete guidance experience in VR. We needed to develop an actual VR experience for them to have since so few members of the community have been able to experience VR on their own so that they could actually give us some feedback on what we were exploring. Now we couldn't also just bring them in and then have them try an existing social virtual reality application such as VR chat or rec room, ones that we showed you earlier on in the slides because these do not have embedded guidance systems. This is a very novel concept as far as accessibility tools go. So not only did we need to bring people in person and give them a VR situation, a VR simulation, but we also needed to make a custom VR simulation that emulates social VR along with our guidance scaffold that we were trying to test. So moving on to the next slide. 
This led us to start developing our own custom VR guide prototype with the goal of simulating the physical guidance aspect between a guide and a guidee or a sighted person or a blind and low vision person, but placing this in VR. So we simulate that physical connection of one hand on the other person's um, elbow through haptic feedback with consumer VR technology and consumer VR equipment. Now, since we are emulating a typical social VR experience, we also decided that we needed to emulate a couple of typical social VR functions in our actual platform. This included things like walking and grabbing. Now, hold on real quick. I actually have a physical thing to show you guys for a demo here. On our platform, since we were going with consumer VR and trying to make consumer VR accessible, we decided to use a MetaQuest 2 headset seen here. Many of you might be familiar with this particular brand of commercial headset and the controllers that go with it. So these typical controllers are the ones that we used for all of our functions in VR. For walking, you would use one of these joysticks to move forward along the ground. For grabbing, you would use the grip button to simulate grabbing an object in reality. For teleportation, you would use the trigger button at the very end of the controller and point at wherever you want to move to. Teleportation simply moves your avatar from one area in the virtual space to the target area indicated at the end of a white reticle line in virtual reality. Besides these basic functions, we incorporated our own custom functions for the guidance scaffolds that we needed since, again, they didn't exist yet. Primarily, the big important function that we created is called shared movement. This is a simulation of sighted guide, but in virtual reality. We have two avatars positioned next to each other. Our guide avatar in the situation is the woman with short black hair. She has a purple jacket and long tan pants. Whenever the participant's avatar, the other pictured avatar here with long pink hair and a white hoodie, stands within one foot of her and then performs the grabbing action as though they were grabbing an object, they actually grab on to the guide themselves. And they snap into place into the common position for sighted guide a little bit behind and to the side of the guide. From that point on, they feel haptic feedback that lets them know that they're holding on to their guide and begin to follow the guide's movements. So if the guide teleports, they teleport. If the guide walks somewhere, they walk somewhere. And they follow the guide in VR. Now, next slide. All right, now this wasn't enough, however, for us to actually go forward with our VR guide prototype. We also needed to establish some guidelines for the guide's behavior. This was a needs finding study. We wanted to see, in other words, how blind and low vision users would use the guide or if they actually needed the guide at all to make their experience a bit more accessible. So we didn't want the guide to actually control the experience, to be too, have too much initiative, to be too controlling of what the participant was doing. Our guiding ideology for what the guide should follow, therefore, was that they should be passive to allow the participants to control the experience. They would not make suggestions, they would not perform actions unless the participant specifically asked them to, and they would really give the participant as much agency as possible over the experience to see how the guide as a tool would be used. Now, we do have some examples of allowed behavior that the guide was allowed to do. They could ask open-ended questions to prompt instructions from the participant, such as, what would you like me to do now? They could answer questions that the participant had asked them, like visual questions about the space, such as, the park bench is over there. They could also ask clarifying questions if they didn't know what the participant was trying to get them to do, like, did you mean you want me to take you to the river? And of course, they could also respond to and perform any requests that the participant asked of them, such as picking up or moving around objects for the participant in the virtual scene. Now, to actually evaluate this VR guide prototype that we created, we brought in 16 blind and low vision participants to our in-person labs here at Cornell Tech. And we got them set up with the VR headset that I showed you guys just now.
We had a two room setup for this study, one room where the participant sat with a researcher in the actual space. That researcher told them about what the study procedure was like, gave them an introduction to it, and helped them put on the headset and equipment. And in a second room, we had a second researcher who acted as a remote guide. Now, both the remote guide and the participant were set up with this VR headset and joined the virtual space together, but they did not see each other at all. And they were, in some cases, quite distant from each other, even many states apart in some points in our study. Now, the actual procedure that the participants went through for this study was that they would first have a tutorial. They would experience a tutorial room that would help them get used to the virtual reality controls. They would learn what the headset was, what the feel of the controllers were and all the different buttons on it, as well as functions assigned to it. Then, once they were comfortable with the VR controls, they began to join virtual parks that we had created for tasks that we assigned them afterwards. For the tasks that I will be talking about here, we had them perform one, an exploration in a first virtual park, so exploring the park with a virtual guide, and then two, a scavenger hunt, actually trying to collect objects around a second virtual park. There were other tasks in other parks that we had these participants do, but for brevity, I will not be talking about those here. You can read about those in our full paper if you're curious. After those tasks were over, we wrapped everything up with an interview about their experience and their thoughts on the guide and guidance. So going into more detail and giving you some visuals about what these tasks look like, our tutorial room was simply a small square room with a purple table in it and two spherical grabbable balls that basically just gave the participants a chance to try out all the different controls, walking, teleportation, grabbing the balls, etc., without a guide present. So a more typical social, well, not really a social VR experience, but a typical VR experience. Moving in to our first park though, for task one, this changed a bit. We have a much more complex environment here. This is um, our most medium sized, I'll call it, uh, park here. So it's about uh, 20 meters by 20 meters. And it is cut through by a large river. There are two bridges that cut over the river, various wooden gazebos and trees scattered throughout, as well as groups of these avatars. I have a picture of one of the avatars up there on the left. These are basically just uh, humanoid avatars that talk to each other. They kind of act like robots in the scene. They don't actually interact with the participant, but they were there to provide a sense that there was actually presences and voices in the scene. Now, our participants would explore this park, however much they felt, getting used to the layout, getting used to the key objects, and actually getting used to the guide, since they needed to be introduced and practice working with the guide. Once they had done this, they moved into our second virtual park and completed our second task, a more complex task, a scavenger hunt. In this park, which was a different virtual park, we exposed them to a much larger environment. This one was far more complex, had various plots of grass, as well as crisscrossing pathways that cut throughout the whole park, trees scattered all over, buildings and structures all over as well, far more avatars talking around the entire space, as well as an entire picnic table area. Now, in addition to this larger, more complex environment, we also had placed five pieces of trash around this park, such as an empty wine bottle, pictured on the left side there. The participant was tasked with going around the park with the assistance of the guide and collecting all five pieces. The goal here was to see if, now that they were familiar with the guide and how the guide worked, they could perform more complex tasks in a virtual environment. We'll now move into our data and analysis. So we had some audio and video recordings of our study sessions from the guide's headset, and we also transcribed those sessions. Two researchers coded the transcripts using open descript descriptive codes, and we generated a codebook from this. And we also conducted a thematic analysis using uh, affinity diagrams. We'll also now move into our, some of our findings. I'll start with an overall summary of how participants performed on the tasks. The participants were able to accurately describe the parks and also interact and explore the environments with their guide. It seems like this is a very promising approach for accessibility because most of the participants were able to complete the tasks and learn about the environments. Participants also said that they found the guide to be useful, the communication to be effective, and they felt comfortable using the guide in a social setting. In the next slide, we show an example of a guidance system, and you'll see a guide and a participant talking about where to go next in the virtual environment.
I don't see anything right now. Um, all right, can we just um, continue on a path? Like, is there a path that goes all the way around it? Over, so yeah, it looks like there's what a path the right behind right us that got to another go. area. They asked the if there's anywhere to okay, go. Okay, let's turn around and, and do that. Uh, the guy grab one again. They see some paths behind them, and the participant said, "Oh, okay, let's go on one of those paths. I'm gonna grab onto you." Yes, that was a summary of what just happened in that video. Um, but as you saw in the video, um, the participants asked for different kinds of information and interacted with the guide in different ways. Um, and we went through the transcripts and coded for different types of information that people asked about. And we found different categories and ways in which people interacted with the guide to fulfill their accessibility needs. First, we found that participants asked about objects in the environment, for example, what an object looked like, um, if they could interact with an object and the location of objects. Next, participants asked about the virtual environment itself, such as contextual information like the time of day. And people also asked about unexplored areas in the virtual environment. Interestingly, participants asked about avatars in the rabbit and what they were doing and the relationships between avatars, such as if they were a couple or if they were a family. Um, participants also asked about VR controls, such as how to do certain actions like teleportation or walking forward. Participants also asked the guide to verify their understanding of the environment, such as their location in the virtual world or the needed movements to do a certain action. The most po common type of interaction with the guide was asking the guide to perform actions for them, such as interacting with objects, asking a guide, can you pick something up and hand it to me? Um, they also asked the guide to move in certain directions or towards a certain area. And this really highlights the different ways in which the participants use the guide and how the guide can support people's different needs. One thing that came through very, very strongly for us was that there were two distinct ways in which participants conceived the guide. First, as a tool or an assistive technology, and second, a companion or even a friend. For the participants who conceived the guide as, guide as a tool, the guide was mainly used for utilitarian requests, um, which means that the participants were very straightforward and to the point, and in fact, over 90% of these participants' requests were utilitarian. And the participants did not ask any personal questions, and they did not engage in small talk, and they only talked to the guide to meet their needs. In comparison, the participants who viewed the guide as a companion engaged with the guide on a very personal level. In fact, 20 to 55% of their requests were very friendly or respectful or apologetic or uncertain. And they wanted to include the guide in their experience, and they also called the guide by her name instead of just guide. In the next slide, we show a video in which John, one of our participants who thought of the guide as a companion, was walking with the guide, came across some people dancing, heard some music, and the participants started dancing and soon after asked the guide to join them. So it seems like there is a playback error here, but um, in this video. I hear the music, I hear the music louder now. Oh, I wanna dance. Hey, 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 hey. dance moves when you only have arms <laughs> By the music I hear the music louder now so participants also had differing perceptions of whether the guide empowered or hindered their independence in fact five participants felt that the guide empowered their independence and they felt supported and empowered by the guide and they felt that they could depend on the guide and count on the guide whenever they needed in the virtual environment in comparison, there was a small number of participants that had an opposite impression, and they felt that having someone there made them feel very dependent and considered this as a negative aspect of their experience. One participant, Noah, had a very strong aversion to the guide's presence, and he told us that, I don't think there's anything that the guide could do to make the experience feel more independent other than if we were able to replace a human guide with an AI guide. I am not relying on a person, I am relying on software that I am telling what to do. That's the difference between asking you to read the computer screen and me using the screen reader to read the computer screen. In this case, Noah felt that having to rely on another person made the 
experienced feel more dependent and felt that having an AGI guide was the only way in which he could feel more independent. So up to this point, we've kind of been mostly talking about observations that we made about the participants and their interactions with the guide, but now we're going to transition into telling you guys a bit more about the direct suggestions that participants gave us on how to improve the guide and general reflections that they had on their experience with the guide. So first, our participants had some very strong ideas about one thing that tended to go wrong during this experience, which was a lack of preemptive information for hazards or obstacles. On this slide, I have a picture of a participant's avatar. You might notice their body is angled towards a picnic table, and they are about to run into that picnic table. Now, as According to our guidelines for the guide's behavior that I mentioned to you all earlier, the guide in this situation would not actually tell the participant that they were going to run into that table unless it was something that the participant had established for them to do earlier, like they had asked them to tell them if they were about to run into obstacles or anything like that. The only indication a participant would have that they had run into this obstacle would be like a wooden collision sound effect that we had actually added into our virtual environment. Now, all of our participants agreed that this was not the way to go going forward. Guides should be preemptive with things like hazards and obstacles. That should always be information that should be given to them in advance, regardless of how much initiative they want the guide to take in the experience, regardless of whether they've asked for it or not. So that's something for us to keep in mind going forward with future guide systems. Now, in addition, one of the richest areas of conversation that we had with our participants was actually the simple question of what should the guide look like? Now, you might recall our initial just default guide design was a young woman with short black hair and sort of average clothes, purple jacket, tan pants. Now, this human appearance, some of our participants really liked it. They liked having the guide just look like a normal human. They liked that it meant that the guide was clearly an individual walking alongside them and experiencing the environment with them. However, a good deal of our participants actually thought that this appearance would not do for all possible virtual reality venues, because there are many different kinds of virtual reality experiences, many different kinds of social experiences as well. In a more formal situation, such as a virtual meeting in Horizon workrooms, some of our participants did like the idea of keeping a traditional human guide with them, or perhaps switching that guide's form to something like a mobility aid, like a white cane, so that they could keep it more traditional and more professional. But if they were in a much more informal environment, a more social place, like perhaps a party in VR chat, they really wouldn't want that sort of human holding them down or cramping their style, if you will. They wanted perhaps options to have a more fun guide appearance, something more interesting than just a classic human avatar, which leads us into our next point here. And it was one of the ideas of one of the most popular appearances that was recommended to us was a bird, or specifically a parrot, sitting on their shoulder. Completely independently of each other, over four of our participants actually all suggested, without us prompting, that the guide be a parrot sitting on their shoulder. It was a discrete form of accessibility. They could have this guide with them, they could ask it for information if they needed to, but it wouldn't really be obvious that it was a separate person with them. It looks like a part of their avatar, like an accessory or some kind of companion, rather than a completely separate individual. And a lot of our participants really liked this idea or this opportunity because it meant that they would have more agency in their experience. They would be the center point and the focal point of the social interactions they were having. People would focus on them rather than on the guide, and a lot of them really liked this idea. Now that leads us actually into another question. Taking this a step further, some of our participants, a small subset, actually wondered if the guide even needed an appearance at all. They talked about the idea of an invisible guide in virtual reality being a much better form of an accessibility tool. One of our participants, Owen, actually put it quite well when he said that having an invisible guide would be what he considered, quote, the ultimate experience, unquote. No one would need to know that there was an accessibility tool with him. No one could tell that he was getting help at all. No one would need to know um, about his disability unless he chose to disclose it. So this invisible guide would be the ideal way to get help without needing to make that obvious to the rest of the social VR community. It was the most independent aspect of guidance. And he really liked this. And several of our other participants did as well. 
Now, all of these findings that we've been discussing open up various points of discussion for the accessibility community in VR going forward and things that we think should be considered. Now, as with any needs finding study or any design project, it's really important to actually make sure you understand the needs of your user group. In our case, the blind and low vision community using virtual reality. Now, past research and past work has looked into the needs of blind and low vision users and come up with some pretty good concrete examples of what they need in VR. However, with our study, we actually found that we came up with a few more through the usage of this guide, which I'll now elaborate for you. First, one of the primary needs was the ability to support embodied interaction between users. Now, in virtual reality, people have avatars, they have bodies that they move with them, but this can actually be a quite difficult aspect to control for the experience for blind and low vision users. For example, even though the guide could help take a participant to something that they were interested in, say I'm interested in this railing and I want it to come to it, the guide couldn't actually orient the participant to face the railing once they were there. They might just be able to get them into the area and then they would disconnect and leave them there. But the participant would have to then be verbally guided to face the correct direction, which could be a challenge. So the actually having the ability to control that bodily orientation, that natural movement of not running into obstacles on your way, of walking in a straight line, that was a pretty big challenge that we found for our blind and low vision users that we think needs to be addressed a little bit more or considered a little bit more. Second, we went into this project assuming that our participants would be most interested in visual information about the space. What things looked like, what the appearance was like, just that visual experience and just descriptions. But we found that that in most cases wasn't enough. A lot of our participants were additionally interested in more contextual information about the space. I have on this slide an example. Two of our most popular avatars from our virtual parks, one male, one female. Many, many questions were asked by many different participants about these two avatars. And it wasn't just what did they look like. It was, are they a couple? Are they in a relationship? Are they arguing? Who's winning the argument? There were a lot of questions that weren't just able to be answered by descriptions or alt text that could have been attached to these avatars of what they looked like. Like. There was a history involved there, reasons for why they were there and what they were doing that you could piece together with some visual information that wouldn't have otherwise been available. We think this needs to be considered going forward as well for accessibility needs. And finally, social support in VR. We found that a lot of our participants were pretty nervous when entering the virtual reality space about actually using it, um, especially if they were very unfamiliar with technology or weren't as comfortable with technology. They were nervous about it, nervous about forgetting what the controls were and not being able to have some sort of reference that they could refer to. And they actually really liked having the guide there, present as a human, that they could talk to about these issues at any point in time. It was almost like a sort of helpline, but at the same time, a social companion that could really bolster their confidence in this experience. Now, it's something that we think should be considered not just for blind and low vision users going forward, but actually for any user group that's entering virtual reality in this pretty new space. This idea of having a social companion to actually help you out instead of perhaps just uh, notifications or some quick blurbs of instructions that happen once and never again might be a much better practice to use going forward with virtual reality support. Yes, and our VR prototype was one basic way to incorporate sighted guidance in VR, but our study uncovered a massive space of opportunities to take this idea and develop this into research projects and products into existing VR platforms. The first opportunity that we uncovered was human guidance frameworks and different systems a guide could be incorporated to to make guides available for users. Um, one idea that we had was using a guide connected based on a friend network seen in friend sourcing. Another idea is connecting through a stranger volunteer system following a crowdsourcing approach. We also found an opportunity for different methods for training guides, and guides might need specific training due to these unique qualities of VR. For example, we can take inspiration from platforms like Be My Eyes or Ira that already have training materials for sighted workers. And future work can also explore what types of training guides should receive, such as the behavior that they should have or the guidelines that they should follow. And this past year, there has been very big advance advancements in AI, and this begs the question, do we need another human or can we have an AI-powered guide? And for this, we can explore how an AI guide would behave, the expectations that we would have of it, and how it would differ from a human guide as well. 
From all of this, our ultimate goal is to take these findings and incorporate guides into all social VR experiences to make it accessible for everyone. In summary, we explored the use of a guide to enhance the accessibility in VR, and we conducted a study with 16 blind and low vision participants. We developed a basic guidance framework, and we also found preferences and design opportunities for virtual guides. Feel free to contact us with any questions that you have that maybe pop into your head after this whole conference is over, or even just a few minutes after we're done talking, if you want. Um, and our emails are up here on the slides. For Crescentia Jung, it is cj382 at cornell.edu. For myself, Jasmine Collins, it is jc2884 at cornell.edu. Thank you very much for listening, and we would be happy to take your questions now. Yes. Uh, what did you use for your virtual environments? Did you create your own or did you use a, oh, sorry. Or did you use like a uh, existing VR program? So do you mean the uh, development environment that it all took place in or like the graphical assets, all of it? All of it. Yeah. All of it. Okay. So for the technical side of development um, and for just creating the environments on themselves, we used Unity as our core program to do all of this stuff in. We used um, Unity scripts and custom programming in order to create our shared movement and all of that, along with like the default XR interaction toolkits that um, Oculus itself provides for the Oculus platform and that Unity provides for its XR development. As far as graphics went, we had a very helpful um, researcher from another lab who actually put together all of the different environments and put together the different avatars for us, I believe, using um, a pretty popular online avatar software called uh, Ready Player Me. Um, that's where our different avatars came from. And uh, our, that other researcher, um, who's in the crowd right now, I believe, I just saw her over there, Yeonju Jung, she, uh, she did that for us. Those are the graphics, the beautiful visuals that you saw. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's how we created it. Unity, um, to put it all together, various graphical programs, and uh, the technical coding also done in C-sharp and Unity. Uh, yes, right here. Um, yeah, hi. So um, you had multiple players in there. Did you use like a multiplayer networking um, framework? And um, sorry if I missed that part, but was the guide and the, um, the low vision user, were they remote or were they in person? Got it, yes. So we did use a multiplayer networking system. We used a system called NormCore. Um, that was a, a joint effort between another researcher um, named uh, Jonathan Seagull, who might be here, might not. I can't, I can't see that one right off the bat as I'm speaking. Um, but he is here today. He'll be doing some demos and poster presentations. So he helped us set up the social uh, virtual reality network there that we used through NormCore. Um, and then as for where the guide and the low vision or blind participant were, they were in separate rooms, so the guide was a remote guide. We actually uh, ran the studies at two different points in time. So at one point, we had participants that we were getting from the CSUN conference, basically, so a big accessibility tech tech conference, and the guide was actually here at Cornell Tech. So there were participants in California and then a guide in New York, so very, very remote there. Um, and then at other points, we had participants in here at our Cornell Tech labs, but they were in separate rooms. So much shorter distance, but still remote and weren't interacting. Cool, thank you. Uh, just another quick question. Have you considered like just using VR chat? Uh, for testing, user testing, before you like went ahead and make a whole new environment, and why did you consider to make another environment? Yes, excellent question. So we did, when we were first initially coming up with this project, we were thinking that maybe we would want to try um, a guidance framework inside of like an existing social VR platform. But we found that while there could be multiple bodies in the same space, and you can you know kind of walk next to each other, there wasn't actually a mechanism to grab on and there wasn't a mechanism to actually uh, do some combined movement between the two. So we couldn't actually simulate what sided guide is really like. It would have ended up being something like, uh, we have someone who's your guide, and then we have you, and the guide saying like, this way, 
this way, come over here. No, not there, a little bit more. Um, and it would have just been all through virtual, um, like verbal voice chat, which is what's primarily used for contact between avatars right now. Um, there's not a lot of like physical options in those existing platforms. So we decided that we needed to create our own that just simulates one to the best of our ability. I think I saw like a couple of hands raising. So we have like one here, one here. I saw that one over there first and you have a microphone, so let's go with you. <laughs> so I'm intrigued by the uh, bird on the shoulder analogy that you said you had four participants who commonly came to. Did you get any insight into the origin of that commonality? It, like maybe it's part of the training that they existingly had between uh, working with guides in the physical world or, you know, where do you where did you find that commonality was stemming from and were there any other kind of trope analogies that people kind of brought up in your research yeah so that's a really interesting question so actually um we we were mostly like shell shocked that so many people were mentioning birds on their shoulders and specifically parrots as well like a parrot on the shoulder that we think that maybe that might have just come from like iconography of like a pirate with a parrot like right there as its companion and we're like okay maybe that's where that's coming from um one participant in particular though gave us an idea of what his inspiration for that was he was particularly interested in norse mythology so he likes the uh imagery of odin with like crows or ravens on his shoulders and so he was like if I was uh, personalizing my avatar, personalizing my guide, um, I could put those like birds on my shoulders and people would be like, oh yeah, that's something he would do. That's definitely him. Um, and then the guide would be like really a part of his customization sequence. So that's where his inspiration for it came from. But the others, we're, we're really not sure. It just seems to be some sort of uh, maybe a understanding that pirates have really good parrots that guide them around. And that's, that's the top companion to beat, so. I think one thing that um, some of our participants also mentioned was that for some of our low vision participants, they were able to like look around and kind of get an idea of what they were seeing. And some of our participants mentioned that having a bird on their shoulder would not like obstruct their view. So they kind of wanted that for their own purposes as well. Uh, yes, in the back. I'm gonna like start like transition. Oh no, you have a microphone, you go first. Thank you. I was just gonna ask you about your 16 participants. Firstly, did you ask them about their preferences in the real world around guiding, so what their practices and, and preferences are in having a sighted guide? And secondly, did you see any difference between different preferences in the real world in their experience and enjoyment of having a sighted guide in the virtual world? Yeah, so do you want to take the sure. <laughs> you ran a lot of the interviews and the questions, so. Um, yeah, so we asked the participants about like their use of guides in the real world and also of like visual interpretation services like Ira and Be My Eyes as well. And we found that most of the participants, um, if not all, had experience with visual interpretation services. And as for guides, a lot of the participants had experience with sighted guides, but only about half of our participants had experience with guide dogs. Um, so I think there were some differences there um, in which they perceived the guide in different ways, especially for the participants who had guide dogs. Um, they kind of view, I think they viewed the guide as more of a tool than as a companion. Jasmine, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so like adding on to that as well, as far as the differences between their preferences they had for guidance in the physical world and VR, we actually found that um, there was a lot more emphasis on uh, visual interpretation. Some of our participants mentioned that they asked this guide for a lot more like visual information and it did a lot more visual interpreting work than they would have normally asked for a guide in the real world. And this might come from the fact that um, when a person is using a guide in the real world, it's usually uh, for navigation only, like you're trying to get from one place to another. You might be interested in like a couple of things going around you and you'll ask if you um, are interested, but uh, a part of that goal is just, you know, navigation. But uh, in this virtual environment, we had put those additional tasks of understanding the space, of understanding its content and exploring it and finding objects. So there was a lot more of a need um, probably just by this study's nature, um, to have some visual interpreting work done that they wouldn't normally assign to a guide in the physical world. Does anyone else have like a mic in hand or something? Oh, I saw a hand lift there and a microphone is in it. Fantastic. Hi. <clears throat> I have a question again about like the power and the invisible guide. Um, I was wondering whether, I imagine that if you have a power on the shoulder or the invisible guide, then the, what the guide will be seeing might be different from the perspective or height and the information available with, to them might be different um, than like 
them embodying like a, a avatar, like humanoid avatar. Was there any discussion about like what the guide would be seeing if they were like in the form of a parrot or invisible guide? And um, any discussion about like what other like um, people or avatars in, in like the scene would be seeing? Would they see the parrot on, on, on their shoulder or would they for invis invisible like guides like I'm curious about that, yeah. Yeah, so as far as what other people would see of the guide, there was a lot of discussion from participants on that. So when it came to the parrot on the shoulder, uh, most of our participants were like, that's a visible guide. They want people to be able to see that. Um, and they want the parrot to be visible as kind of like a, a customizable option on their avatar. For the invisible guide, it was this idea of like an invisible voice in their head type thing, where to everyone else, no one would be able to see the guide and no one would be able to hear it either. It would be something that only they would hear here, and uh, they wouldn't have to look at it, I guess you would say, either, because it's completely invisible. It's just a disembodied voice that's with them. Um, so that's kind of like what the discussion was there. As far as what the guide would see, that was something we didn't discuss with participants, but that's an interesting um, technical um, thing to think about because your body in virtual reality can actually be shifted around in a lot of interesting ways. Just because you're in the form of a parrot, for example, doesn't mean you'll actually have to have your camera, which um, is where your vision comes from, put in the parrot's eyes. You could actually have a camera positioned a little bit away from the, car the carrot, from the parrot. Um, so say your virtual body is actually perched permanently on a shoulder, but the camera that gives you vision is actually standing a little bit in front of the person at all times, like it's offset. You can do that. You can actually offset where the camera is from where the body is. So we could play around with some interesting arrangements of having the guide's body be in one place, but their consciousness or their vision, if you will, would be somewhere else or we could actually still give them like a full human kind of perspective of the world, even if their body was different. All right, uh, we've got some great questions coming in from Zoom here. I think we've got time for just one or two before the next session. Um, first one was, uh, did the, uh, from Abigail uh, Stengel, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Great presentation. Did the participants bring up any ethical concerns around the accuracy of AI-assisted companionship, uh, privacy, et cetera? Do you want to take that one, Crescentia? There's, there's a lot of discussion there. <laughs> um, do you want to start off? Yeah, I could start us off. Okay, so in, in short answer, yes, very, very much so. There was a lot of ethical discussions that were brought up for this. Um, just to give like a short example of the visibility aspect of the guide. Participants brought up a couple of different ethical angles for that. It's like, if the guide is invisible, is that uh, unfair in some way? Is that creating an ethical or moral dilemma that other people in a virtual space don't know they're being observed by some kind of invisible guide? Like they don't actually, they're not aware of like the human presence that's there watching them, giving information about them, etc. Only, only the uh, actual guidee is aware of that. So there are ethical concerns there with like the security of other users and the fairness of that. Um, there were also concerns with um, the guide listening in on conversations. So for example, if you were at a virtual work conference, if you have the invisible guide and the guide is sitting there on your shoulder, can the guide hear everything that you might be saying in confidence to a work partner or work colleague or hearing about your work or something confidential that they shouldn't actually be hearing about? And we talked with some participants about ways to mitigate this, like perhaps having a button that can mute what the guide hears so that they are not kind of privy to that sort of security information, um, but it's like a question to consider. And that leads into another ethical concern that a lot of participants brought up, which was actually how much control they had over the guide. So with it being a human guide or being a human behind the guide, some participants felt really uneasy about the idea of controlling how that guide was presenting themselves in VR. Like, I'm controlling what they look like. I'm controlling how they behave. I'm controlling what they hear. And participants were kind of uneasy about that because it's like, well, they want to have agency in their own experience, yes, but that doesn't mean that they want to completely take away every aspect of existing from the guide and force them to kind of uh, fit this whatever mold that they decide is best for them, um, which is kind of where a lot of participants leaned towards the AI guide and thought that would be a bit better because you're just adjusting a tool. It's just technology. You don't have to worry about that as much in an ethical sense of whatever you want to adjust it to. That's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, those are just some of the ethical concerns we talked about um, offhand. Uh, Christian, you got any to add? Um, I think we also had 
a probing question that we asked the participants about whether or not they wanted the guide to know of their visual condition beforehand, and participants also had some privacy concerns about this. Some participants said that it would be helpful for the guide to know that ahead of time, whereas other participants um, said that they would rather not have the guide to know that information. So I think there was a lot of differing opinions on this topic. All right, well, thanks very much uh, to our presenters here. It was a fabulous way to kick off the day.